have you ever uh, really stopped to think about what's going on behind the scenes with all this AI stuff? You know, chat GPT, your streaming recommendations, they seem instant, but there's just this massive amount of computation happening. And for years, really, one name just dominated that whole space. NVIDIA, their GPUs, they were the kings, the absolute go-to hardware. But is that rain, you know, completely unshakable? Today, we're doing a deep dive into what we're calling the Silicon Schism. It's this quiet, but frankly, powerful challenge coming from Broadcom and their custom ASIC strategy. We're going to explore how this could really reshape the whole AI hardware landscape and why that matters for, well, all of us using this tech. We've dug into quite a bit here, industry analysis, financial reports, trying to get a good look at both sides. Our goal really is to help you understand not just what's happening, but why it's significant for the future of AI. Yeah, and what's so interesting here, I think, is that this isn't just you know company A versus company B. It's more like a clash of philosophies. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally different ideas about how you actually build the infrastructure for AI's future. Specialization versus generalization, basically. That's a great way to put it, a clash of philosophies. Okay, so to really get that, we probably need to start with NVIDIA's empire, their GPUs, right? They were originally for graphics, for gaming, but then, almost by accident, they became the engine for the AI revolution. It was this uh, architectural serendipity, as some call it, the way they handle parallel processing, perfect for deep learning's math problems. And NVIDIA saw this early. They invested, they optimized these things for general computing way before the AI boom really hit. That gave them a huge first mover advantage. Oh, absolutely. And if you connect that to the bigger picture, NVIDIA's real advantage, their um their deepest moat isn't just the hardware, it's the software ecosystem. QDA, QDA has been around since, what, 2006. It's way more than just code. It's this whole comprehensive ecosystem. You've got libraries like Cut ENN, Cup Latest, such as pre-built toolkits that make it much, much easier for developers to get AI models running fast on NVIDIA chips. Plus, compilers, tools, and this huge global community. Millions of developers know QDA, and that creates this incredibly powerful lock-in effect. If you're a company, and you spent years, maybe millions, Building your AI on CDA, switching is just incredibly painful. Think about it, rewriting software, retraining your engineers, validating everything. It's costly, extremely high switching costs. So yeah, the big question becomes, how do you even try to compete with something that entrenched? Wow. Yeah, it sounds almost like an iron cage. And the numbers back that up, right? The market share is just staggering. We're talking, what, 80, 90% of the AI accelerator market, data center GPUs, it's even higher. And the financial power that comes with that, I mean, their revenue went from maybe $11 billion a few years back to over $130 billion now. Market cap passed $4 trillion recently. It's wild. And that gives them incredible pricing power. Those H100 GPUs, they're going for like $25,000, maybe even $40,000 each. Hyperscalers are spending billions just on chips. Exactly. And they don't sit still. NVIDIA reinforces this dominance with a, well, frankly, a relentless product cycle. It's almost predictable now. Hopper, then H200, Blackwell, Blackwell Ultra, now Ruby, now it's for 2006. It's an aggressive annual cadence. And there's a strategy behind that speed. It creates a huge problem for anyone trying to build custom chips, this moving target issue. Imagine you spend, say, two years designing a custom ASIC, an application-specific integrated circuit, to match NVIDIA's current chip. By the time your ASIC is actually ready for production, NVIDIA's probably works one, maybe even two generations ahead, much more powerful. It's a captivated move, really messes with the return on investment for custom silicon projects, makes a multi-million dollar bet very risky. Okay, so that's NVIDIA's fortress. Seemingly impregnable, but like you said, there's another philosophy at play. Let's pivot to Broadcom. While NVIDIA was building GPUs, Broadcom, especially under Hawk Tan, was doing something very different. Tan's strategy since, what, 2006? It's been about acquiring established tech leaders, companies with really sticky customer bases, then applying this rigorous financial discipline, focusing hard on cash flow, profit margins. We saw it with LSI, Brocade, CA, Symantec, and then the huge one, the $61 billion VMware acquisition in 2023, and Tan staying on a CEO until 2030, that signals stability, which you need for these kinds of long-term plays. Right. And what's really interesting is how Broadcom is becoming this um, company of two interconnected halves. You've got the semiconductor solutions, their traditional strength, and now this massive infrastructure software piece, thanks mainly to VMware. That VMware deal, that was truly transformative. It wasn't just about size. It was a strategic bet to become a major player in private and hybrid clouds. It lets them create this vertically integrated platform through VMware Cloud Foundation, VCF, they can offer a whole pre-integrated private cloud stack. Optimized, and you can see the potential flywheel there, right? The hardware custom chips, 
networking drives the software adoption. And the software integration makes the hardware more valuable. It's a fundamentally different approach. Full stack infrastructure versus NVIDIA's focus on best in class components and that crucial software layer. And the market seems to buy into this strategy, doesn't it? Broadcom's market cap also soared over $1.4 trillion. Revenue's huge, around $60 billion recently. Investor confidence looks really high. Strong valuation, analysts calling it a strong buy. They clearly believe in this custom silicon push, especially for AI. So this isn't just dabbling. It feels like a deliberate strategic pivot to challenge NVIDIA, but on different turf. Okay, so the weapon of choice here is the ASIC. We mentioned it before, application-specific integrated circuit. For those of us more used to thinking about GPUs, what exactly is an ASIC? How is it different? Well, the name kind of gives it away. Application specific. The core idea is extreme optimization. You design the chip for one particular job and strip out everything else, all the general purpose flexibility you find in a GPU. So unlike a GPU that can handle lots of different tasks, an ASIC might be hardwired just for, say, language translation or maybe powering a recommendation engine. And because it's so specialized, it can do that one job incredibly efficiently. We're talking lower latency, higher throughput, and critically much lower power consumption. Ah, okay, power consumption. That sounds like a big deal for the hyperscalers. Well, it's huge. For companies like Google, Meta, Amazon, Microsoft, running data centers at planetary scale, power isn't just an environmental concern, it's a massive operational cost. Millions, potentially billions, on electricity. So for them, performance per watt is arguably the most important metric. And this is where ASICs shine. They can offer maybe up to 50% better energy efficiency compared to GPUs, especially for inference that's running the already trained AI models. Scale that across hundreds of thousands of servers running constantly. You're saving potentially hundreds of millions a year just on the power bill. Now, designing one, the upfront cost and non-recurring engineering, or NRE, is very high, easily over $20 million for the advanced ones. But the volume is massive. The lower cost per chip plus the power savings means the total cost of ownership, the TCO, can end up being dramatically lower than using GPUs. And we've seen this play out, right? Google's TPU, Amazon's Inferentia, and Tranium chips. They've been doing this for years. It shows AI is moving from being just R&D, a cost center, to being operational, a profit center that needs serious economic optimization. Right, but that specialization, that's also the risk, isn't it? The inflexibility. If the AI algorithm changes or you find a flaw after making the chips, that expensive ASIC becomes, what, a paperweight? Exactly, it's a major trade-off. Uh. That multi-million dollar design becomes useless silicon and add that long design cycle we talked about, 12, maybe 24 months, there's significant market risk. What if your needs change? What if NVIDIA leaps ahead again? So that's why it's really only these giant hyperscale companies playing in the custom ASIC space. They have the scale, the stable workloads. Precisely. They're the ones who can justify the investment and manage the risks yeah. because their scale is just so immense. Okay, so how does Broadcom fit into this picture for these hyperscalers? They're not just selling off-the-shelf ASICs, are they? No, not at all. Their model is fundamentally about co-design. They act almost like an extension of their customer's own chip design team. It's deep collaboration. The hyperscaler brings the knowledge, their AI models, their software, what they need the chip to do. Broadcom brings its huge portfolio of proven, pre-validated IP blocks. Think like best-in-class building blocks for networking, for connecting chips together, memory interfaces, Plus, their expertise in actually designing the physical chip and handling the complex manufacturing logistics. So it's like building with high-tech Lego blocks. Take some of the risk out, speeds things up. That's a good analogy, yeah. It de-risks the process significantly and can really accelerate the time to market compared to starting entirely from scratch. And you mentioned Google and Meta as examples. Right. Google's TPU partnership, starting back in 2016, that was really the foundational case study. It proved this model works and established Broadcom's credibility. And that relationship is still going strong, which shows how sticky these deep partnerships can be. Once you're integrated like that, it's hard to switch. Then they replicated that success with Meta for their MPIA chips, tailored for Meta's recommendation algorithms. That showed it wasn't a one-off, it was a repeatable business model. Okay, Google, Meta major players, but then came the OpenAI partnership. This feels different, somehow bigger. Well, it's huge, game-changing potentially. We're talking reports of over $10 billion in initial orders. So for OpenAI, what's the driver? Is it just cost? It's several things. It definitely helps de-risk their operations. They're incredibly reliant on NVIDIA right now, right? This reduces that dependency. It helps with supply chain worries, gives them leverage against NVIDIA's pricing power. But maybe most importantly, it lets them design hardware that is perfectly optimized for their next generation models like GPT-5 or whatever comes next. 
aiming for that superior TCO and performance per watt, tailored exactly to their needs. And for Broadcom, obviously $10 billion is massive financially, but strategically. Strategically, it's arguably even bigger. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate validation. You've got the leading AI lab, the company defining the cutting edge of large language models, choosing your custom ASIC approach. The market certainly saw it that way. Broadcom stock jumped, videos took a hit on the news, it sent a powerful signal. So what does this signal, what does it mean for how we understood ASICs versus GPUs? Well, this is where it really shatters the old narrative. The thinking used to be, ASICs are great for inference, for running stable high volume models efficiently, but for the complex, dynamic, supercompute intensive task of training these massive frontier LLMs, you needed the flexibility of GPUs. OpenAI's decision basically says, no, at our scale, even for training the most advanced models, the economic and performance benefits of a custom ASIC now outweigh the GPU's flexibility. It legitimizes the ASIC approach, not just for, you know, older or simpler AI, but as a key strategic tool for the absolute cutting edge. That's a fundamental shift in perception. Wow. Okay, so this sets up a really interesting dynamic. You've described NVIDIA's approach as merchant silicon standard products for the whole market, and Broadcom's as custom silicon bespoke solutions for a few giants. Exactly. It creates this market bifurcation. NVIDIA serves the broad market enterprises, startups, researchers, anyone who needs flexibility and can leverage that huge CED ecosystem. Broadcom serves the few, the hyperscalers and leading AI labs who operate at such extreme scale that the economics of custom silicon makes sense. So the threat to NVIDIA isn't that Broadcom will suddenly take over the whole market? No, I don't think anyone sees that happening. Yeah. CDA is too entrenched for the broad market. The threat is more subtle, but potentially very impactful. It's the erosion of NVIDIA's most profitable, highest volume customer segment, the hyperscalers. Because now, these crucial customers have a credible build option with Broadcom alongside NVIDIA's buy option. Mm -hmm. That gives them immense negotiating leverage. It fundamentally changes the power dynamic, and inevitably, that's going to put downward pressure on NVIDIA's pricing power and gross margins for their very top-end chips going forward. They have real competition for those biggest deals now. And you mentioned networking earlier. That seems like another key battleground here, maybe less visible. Absolutely critical. These AI systems aren't just chips. They're massive interconnected systems. Networking is the fabric holding it all together. And Broadcom is incredibly strong here. There are Tomahawk Ethernet switches, Jericho routers. They're basically industry standards in data centers. NVIDIA knows this is vital too. That's why they've invested so heavily in NVLink for chip-to-chip -chip links and their Spectrum X Ethernet platform. Networking is a multi-billion dollar business for them now as well. So they're both fighting to control the whole AI data center stack chips and networking. Pretty much. It's about offering that complete integrated solution. Who controls the interconnects has a lot of power. Okay, looking ahead, what do the market projections say about this split? Well, the overall AI chip market is expected to be enormous several hundred billion dollars by the early 2030s. It's just a massive wave. And within that, Analysts generally expect the custom ASIC segment, Broadcom's territory, to grow at the fastest rate, the highest TUGR. One projection, I think, from Bank of America suggested Broadcom's share of the total AI compute and networking pie could double, maybe from around 11 percent to near 24 percent by 2027. So significant gains for Broadcom, but NVIDIA is still dominant overall. Yes, but Broadcom's biggest impact might not even be the market share points it wins directly. It might be the economic effect that gravitational pull it exerts on NVIDIA's pricing and margins in that super lucrative hyperscaler segment. It effectively puts an economic ceiling where maybe there wasn't one before. Okay, so let's try to wrap this up. We've seen NVIDIA's dominance built on GPUs and that powerful CUD ecosystem securing the broad market. But Broadcom has mounted this really smart strategic challenge using custom ASICs, targeting the very biggest players, the hyperscalers, the leading AI labs. And that OpenAI partnership really validated this approach, showing ASICs are for frontier AI now, not just older stuff. The main threat to NVIDIA seems less about technology being overtaken and more about economic disruption at the high end. I think that's a fair summary. And the most likely outcome looking forward is probably what you could call a bipolar market. NVIDIA keeps serving the broad horizontal market companies needing flexibility, leveraging CUDA. And Broadcom enables a handful of the world's tech giants to employ highly optimized custom silicon for their biggest, most critical workloads. Both strategies coexist, serving different needs. So for listeners trying to track how this plays out, what should they keep an eye on? Definitely watch the hyperscalers' capital expenditure reports. Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Meta. Are they talking more about custom silicon investments? 
Keep an eye on competitors too, like AMD's progress with their MI series GPUs or Intel's Gaudi accelerators. Any traction there also adds pressure. Obviously, watch for any announcements of new custom ASIC projects from other big tech firms. And the financials, I assume, quarterly reports. Absolutely. NVIDIA's and Broadcom's data center or AI revenue growth is key. But maybe even more telling will be the trend in their gross margins. Are NVIDIA's high-end margins holding up under this pressure? And don't forget, networking. Watch how NVIDIA's Spectrum X business performs against Broadcom's established Tomahawk and Jericho lines. Okay, lots to watch. Before we finish, maybe one last thought to leave people with. Yeah, here's something interesting to think about. As the hardware, these chips, become increasingly specialized, tailored to specific AI models, how might that change AI innovation itself? Will we see more breakthroughs driven by this hyper-efficiency for specific tasks? Or could the loss of that broad general-purpose flexibility maybe slow down progress on more general AI capabilities? Sure. It's a fascinating question about the interplay between hardware and the direction of AI research. Hmm, that is interesting. Specialization versus generalization coming back full circle. Well, this has certainly been a fascinating deep dive into the Silicon Schism. I hope you walked away with some powerful insights today and maybe a new appreciation for the battles happening inside the machines powering our world.